absent. Uh, Trustee Olson? Here. Trustee Kishinev? Present and accounted for. Okay, Trustee Iverson says he'll be late. And Trustee Dodd? Here. Thank you. Okay. We will we'll move, move to, to the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. As we gather today, it is important to acknowledge that Napa Valley College and the surrounding Napa Valley sit on the unceded tra traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homelands of the Miwok, Hatwin, who are comp composed of three federally recognized tribes. The Cashel Dihi Band of Winton Indians, the Kletzel Dihi Band of Winton Indians, and the Yocha Dihi Winton Nation, and Wapo, including the Mishua Wapo, also known as the Onastis people. As part of Napa Valley College's mission of preparing students for evolving roles in a diverse, dynamic, and interdependent world, and in accordance with the college's values of honesty, integrity, inclusivity, and respect for others, we make this acknowledgement. We also affirm that this acknowledgement is insufficient. It does not undo the harm that has been and continues to be perpetrated against Indigenous people, the land and water. May we hold steady in our commitment to be in solidarity and in action to seek equity and justice with the Miwok, Atlan, and Wapo peoples. We will now move on to adoption of our agenda. Um, there is one change we will be pulling Item 6.2, public employment. Any other changes? Seeing none, we will adopt it by consensus and move on to our study session. Uh, at this time, the board will devote up to 15 minutes to hear comments regarding closed session items. Individual comments will be limited to three minutes. Catherine, do we have any public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, the board will move into closed session covering public employee performance evaluation, uh, item 5.2, uh, pursuant to section 154957, public employee and employment, and the same for item 5.3. Thank you. <laughs> From closed session a little bit earlier at 525 p.m., um, we have two announcements from closed session. The board approved the following appointment uh, appointments to a full-time temporary at-will classified administrative assignment in closed session. Daniel Vega is acting director IT uh, from June 1, 2023 through August 31, 2023, or until that position is filled on a regular basis, whichever occurs first. Acting director's uh, monthly salary will be based on admin confidential salary schedule range 17, step E. Mr. Vega will also receive monthly stipend of 10% of classified salary schedule range 31, step H for retaining network admin duties. Salary and stipend will be prorated for any partial month of service. And we also announced that Denise Kaduri is acting director of public affairs and communications from July 24 through October 31, 2023, or until that position is filled on a regular basis, whichever occurs first. Acting director's monthly salary will be based on admin confidential salary schedule range 19, step A. Ms. Kaduri will also receive a monthly stipend of 10% of classified salary schedule range 15, step E, for retaining web and content specialist duties. Salary and stipend will be prorated for any partial month of service. Do you guys have a warrant? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll move on to a public comment. This public comment opportunity is governed by the California Brown Act. By definition, this is an opportunity to hear concerns, perspectives, and differing vantage points. The board is not able to, under the Brown Act, to engage in any level of conversation or discussion, but we look forward to this opportunity to gather community input. At this time, the board will devote up to 15 minutes to take any comments uh, on any subject not appearing as an agenda item for this meeting, but over which the board has jurisdiction. No action or discussion will occur at this time, and each comment shall last no longer than three minutes. Catherine, have we received any public comment? Uh, no, we have not. 
I have not received any either. Um, so we will move on to consent. Is there any well, changes to consent? Can ask again. That somebody just appeared in in the uh, in the attendees list. Okay. I'll uh, if someone that's on our attendees would like to make any public comment, please raise your hand. Yes. No. No. Thanks, Catherine. No, I appreciate that. There, the hand went up. Oh, did it? Okay. <laughs> Hold on, just oops. Um, I'll bring her in. Hi, hi there, everybody. Hi there. Can you? Hi, you doing? Um, sorry about that. I I I jumped in at five thirty. It looks like I was a couple minutes late, but thank you so much for letting me um, make public comment. I'm just here to talk a little bit about the Napa Valley Writers Conference. So we are set to begin on July 30th this year. It's a week from this Sunday. And I'm going to go ahead and send everyone um, on the board an email and I'll be sending out emails to the college community as well. But I just wanted to issue a special invitation to all of you to join us for some of our public programs that we're going to be offering during conference week. So the public is invited to almost all of the craft lectures and talks, almost all of the programming that we offer is open to the public um, with the exception of the workshops. And this year, we actually are offering a community drop-in poetry workshop that's gonna be taught by a wonderful poet, Katie Ferris. And so this workshop will be meeting Monday through Friday at 10.30 a.m. Members of the community can just drop into the workshop if you've ever felt like you might want to try your hand at poetry, you think you might have a poem inside of you. This is a perfect opportunity for you to have some fun with that. And Katie will just be leading each day's class through some poetry prompts, poetry shares, and also you'll have a chance to get some feedback on any poetry you write. So um, we're, we're really wanting to kind of encourage people to kind of dip their toe in. And we also offer afternoon classes every day, discussions, guided reading discussions of the readers who will be reading that night. And our faculty this year is just incredible. We have Carl Phillips in poetry who just won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry this year. Victoria Chang, who won the Pulitzer two years ago. Um, Robert Haas is teaching our translation workshop and he is a Pulitzer winner, um, a National Book Award winner and a former US Poet Laureate. And so um, we are just super excited about the faculty that we have and the programming that we have. And we really wanna encourage you to, to join us if you can for um, any one of these opportunities or all of them. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, stopping by our, our, our meeting to make that announcement. It sounds really exciting. And what a great uh, lineup for the faculty. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Catherine. We would have missed that. That would have been bad. Yeah. Um, we will move on to our consent calendar. Are there any changes to uh, consent? Um, then I would welcome a motion for approval. And approve. Thank you, Trustee Olson, for your motion and Trustee DeLuna for your second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent approved unanimously. We will move on to 12.1. Catherine, I have that right? No, I oh, excuse me. Yeah, I don't have that. Thank you. Um, I'll call on Dr. Powell, you had something, or do you want to just kick it off to Dr. Monsami? He's, he's ready to go. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. So, good afternoon, Board of Trustees, Dr. Powell, members of the President's Cabinet, colleagues, and members of the public. I'm pleased to present you with an overview of diversity, equity, and inclusion activities and accomplishments for the 2022-23 academic year. 
This includes the work of my office, the DEI committee, collaborations with colleagues, engagements with the community, and learning opportunities to advance our understanding of and commitment to social justice, anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide. So I and several members of the DEI committee were very engaged in strategic planning activities to ensure that equity mindedness was at the forefront of these plans. These included the development of the 2022 through 2025 student equity plan, the strategic enrollment management plan and its integration with the student equity plan, and also involvement in um, guided pathways planning. So through participation in the Guided Pathways Columbia College Summer Institute last summer, the Guided Pathways Task Force, and contributions to the Guided Pathways Integration Plan. Next slide, please. In the arena of professional learning, I facilitated an intensive reading and critical engagement series with the math department, building on the work of the DEI colloquia offered in the spring of 2022. Um, DEI colloquia was tailored to the needs of the math department faculty. We had during the spring semester, an intensive reading and learning series. And um, as an outcome of that, there's an invitation for um, me to continue this work with other academic departments moving into the future. I also collaborated with the Human Resources Department on the development of DEI professional learning for managers and executives. This will be offered in the fall semester. Served on the Academic Senate IEPI Grant Task Force to meet with the IEPI Partnership Resource Team and plan the implementation of the grant. Also con collaborated with the Academic Senate on de the development of the Academic Senate Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching and Learning and professional, strands, professional learning strands of activity. We also, as an institution, renewed our membership with the University of Southern California and the California Community College Racial Equity Leadership Alliance. And through this alignment, um, the Alliance, uh, we offer professional learning opportunities on a series of DEI related topics. That was through the um, Racial Equity Leadership Alliance e-convenings. Slide please. In the area of grant development, um, we received funding to create a more inclusive and supportive environment for our LGBTQ plus community, and also to develop innovative practices to expand the culturally responsive pedagogical practices of our faculty. So we received an LGBTQ plus grant from the California Community Colleges, and this will fund the development of the LGBT Center, the Pride Center, um, professional development and training and serving LGBTQ students, the establishment of an LGBTQ learning community, the Lavender graduation, and an LGBTQ workshop and speaker series. And this is being led by Greg Miraglia. He's doing a great job with that. I also co-wrote with um, Dr. Eileen Tejada a proposal for culturally responsive pedagogy and practices, innovative best practices grant. And we were awarded $300,000 to support professional learning for faculty. This strengthens the collaboration and partnership between the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and the Academic Senate and continues the important work that the Academic Senate has already engaged in in this area. Next slide, please. In the arena of curricular development, um, understanding the importance of Napa Valley College as an educational leader in the region and the important role it can take in improving DEI literacy and anti-racist equitable practices under the leadership of Chantel Ridgel and in collaboration with Dr. Tia Madison and Chara Baran, we developed a non-credit course, Anti-Racism in the Workplace. 
So that will be available um, to the public. And we're envisioning that as something that businesses will um, enroll their employees in to advance uh, DEI work within their organizations. Next slide, please. So DEI work, as we know, is data-driven. We need to gather data to understand how students and staff experience the college, its climate, and the climate of the wider Napa Valley region. So um, we developed and coordinated materials for the National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climates Racial Climate Survey. This was administered to non-instructional full-time staff in fall of 2022. In spring of 2023, we received the data from the National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climates Racial Climate Survey that had been administered to students in the spring of 2022. So uh, we had a campus forum to discuss the survey data. This was in April 2023. This was co-facilitated with Dr. Guerrero and Dr. Mora. We also um, have an invitation from the Academic Senate to further engage with this data at the fall 2023 flex day. So this data is really providing important information on um, how our students are experiencing our college and what we need to do to improve that experience. Next slide, please. So with the district-wide DEI committee, we have a structure for advancing the social justice, anti-racist DEI work of the college. This committee has representation from all the college constituencies, as well as the Napa Valley community. The committee has input into a broad range of college activities, including the development of strategic plans, DEI language to be used by the college, college programming, college operations, and college community engagements. So a few of the accomplishments um, this past year was to really do a dive into what we mean by equity and to start to develop a college-wide definition of equity and equity-mindedness. The committee also played an important role in the development of the student equity plan. And also importantly this year, uh, I think more than in other years, the DEI committee served as a forum to hear the concerns of DE of, of um, college employees in various sectors of the college about their experiences and provided us an opportunity to think critically about what we need to do to improve the experiences for our employees as well as our students. Next slide, please. So as you know, um, the Land Acknowledgement Work Group, which was a subcommittee of the DEI committee, finalized the NBC Land Acknowledgement. Um, the board approved the resolution to adopt the Land Acknowledgement at the March 2023 meeting. And um, as part of this work, we've conducted research to collect educational materials on indigenous history in Napa County and surrounding areas. We've developed a draft statement of institutional commitments to the indigenous community. And we'll be continuing this work um, as well as work to establish a Native American advisory committee for the college that will help uh, support our efforts with our indigenous community so that we can think about what are appropriate um, cultural practices that will inform our educational um, efforts and our support for this community as well. Next slide, please. To address concerns um, among our learning communities, communities about um, a lack of transparency, unequal funding opportunities, inconsistent marketing of the learning communities, and inadequate supports for learning communities, I established the Learning Community Resource and Support Group. So we had an initial retreat last September, and at that retreat, the, um, the participants, the learning community, coordinators decided that it would be fruitful to continue to have an ongoing series of meetings of the group on a monthly basis. So we had those meetings um, throughout the year, once a month. 
And um, it was an opportunity to share best, best practices, to address the needs of the communities, and to allow for presentations on resources that can support our learning communities. We had participation from all of the learning communities, um, Kese Sayan, Puente, Amoja, the new Pride Learning Community, as well as um, participation from our Vice President for Student Affairs and for Academic Affairs. The Superintendent President was also there, as well as presenters who were um, sharing information about resources to support our learning communities. Next slide, please. Um, an important part of the work that I do is um, to have ongoing communications to the campus. And these communications center around heritage months, days that we honor social activists, um, historic moments in the history of our nation. And um, also it's an opportunity for my office and the president's office to respond to significant um, occurrences that are happening at a local level and a national level related to um, communities that have been historically marginalized. And also uh, the DEI communications include messaging about DEI related learning opportunities and events. Slide please. Cultural programming has been an important part of the work that my office has been engaged in and um, listed are some of the programs that we've had this past year. Um, it's provided opportunities for learning about particular um, ethnic or racial groups to learn about our um, the local indigenous community in our area, the Onitsatis. We had a series of four workshops where they talked about their, um, their practices, their culture, their history, et cetera. Um, we also had opportunities for film screening and book reading and discussion that dove deeply into issues of colonialism, decolonization, um, race, and uh, ethnicity. Um, we also, this was um, an event that was organized by Mandisa Wood when she was the um, coordinator of the Cultural Center. And that was a public interview and um, dramatic reading with a playwright, an African-American playwright, Chris Eli Black, who wrote a play about Mary Ellen Pleasant, who was someone, an African-American woman who's actually buried in uh, the Napa uh, Tulake Cemetery. She was an important um, African-American woman who actually amassed quite a large amount of wealth as a businesswoman and was um, somebody who supported a lot of civil rights activism uh, during um, during the end of the slavery era. So she's a very important person. So we had this um, playwright that was, um, this was a collaborative effort with the Napa County Historical Society and the Shakespeare Napa Valley and Napa Valley College. So it was a nice collaboration. Um, my office provides ongoing uh, support to the Cultural Center and um, an exciting new opportunity that we're working on is um, planning for a Global South annual music performance series. And this is in collaboration with Dr. Christina Howell. And um, the first event is uh, going to be co-sponsored by um, Student Affairs Office and my office with the music department. And that's gonna be exciting. So be on the lookout for the um, announcement of that event. Next slide. So as part of um, that um, support of the playwright who did the work on Mary Ellen Pleasant, um, one of the founders of the Napa Equity and Inclusivity Council, Hannah Henry, organized a cleanup of Mary Ellen Pleasant's grave. And so I, along with other members of the Equity and Inclusivity Council, participated in that. Um, members of our community participate in the Napa Equity and Inclusivity Council meetings. So this allows us to remain connected to other equity 
and DEI um, efforts happening within the region. I also had a meeting with um, members of Pacific Union College to plan collaborations around DEI and programming. And also um, at the behest of uh, Trustee Tishanef, we've met with leaders from the Islamic, Islamic Center of Vallejo and Congregation of Israel regarding future collaborations and creating more inclusive spaces at Apple Valley College. So we'll be following up on that. Next slide, please, Catherine. So an important part of the work that we identified in the student equity plan is the need to have uh, more culturally inclusive spaces in and around campus. And so when we think about um, culturally inclusive spaces and how we can memorialize important moments in the life of college, um, one of the first things that we did was to um, have the welcome celebration for Dr. Powell. And I see that as one of the moments in which we're memorializing a historic event at the college. So at that event, we had a diversity of speakers. We had self-guided tour of our programs and centers. And we also showcased our equity programs and highlighted success stories of our students that are served by these equity programs. Other um, future events to um, revitalize interior and exterior spaces around campus are to revitalize the Japanese garden. This was a gift from Imanoba, Japan in 1982. And that's um, the sister city of Napa. And so, um, Elena Sorignano uh, reached out to me um, to say that her husband, Jeff Hayes, John Hayes, sorry, and Jeff Moore, who was the son of a member of the initial Napa um, Iwanuma Sister City Council, that they would both be interested in volunteering their time to help us revitalize that garden. So we've started to have uh, meetings and are planning that redevelopment so that we can honor um, that cultural space and that history at the college. Other future, future um, projects are, and this is an outgrowth of one of our meetings with the Islamic Center of um, Vallejo, is the creation of meditative spaces. As we realize that on our campus, we really don't have a space for um, students who are honoring their religious obligations to go and do that while they're here on campus. So that's an important thing that we're going to be working on. Um, also in my conversations with Hannah Henry, she received a grant from the Napa County Historical Society. It's um, the 100, 100 plaques project. And this is a project to establish plaques throughout Napa that um, historicize uh, the um, contributions of communities that are historically underrecognized. So she is willing to have some of those plaques established here on Napa Valley College's campuses. So we're going to be working on that together. We also would like to do some photo exhibits, some art installations, and maybe also have some gardens rooted in cultural practices of various communities. So these are some ideas for future projects that we can engage in. Um, next slide, please. So in uh, January of this year, um, Greg Maraglia organized and taught the Stop the Heat training. And this is a training that is focused on how people can respond to incidents of um, hate or bias activities. So we have that um, Stop the Heat training and as an outgrowth of that, we're going to be also um, reestablishing our bias incident response team. We also um, had campus communications in response to hate based violence um, and also a vigil in response to the anti Asian crimes and violence that took place in January of this year. Next slide, please. So in terms of professional development, um, 
I attended the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education Conference. This is the premier organization, the professional organization that su supports people in roles like mine, those who are taking the leadership uh, position to um, forward the diversity and and inclusion agenda of colleges. So that was held in Baltimore. I also attended the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity. And there was actually quite a nice representation from Napa Valley College at that, um, at that conference as well. Math department, many members of the math department attended and, and other people across the campus attended. And I want to thank um, the HSI STEM grant for providing support for us to attend this conference. We have uh, also engaged in ongoing research to keep abreast of trends and best practices in diversity, equity, and inclusion, anti-racism, social justice, and my office also provides support to um, fund the professional development of faculty and staff who are interested in pursuing education and DEI. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you, that, that is the last slide. So um, I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank the classified staff who have provided administrative support to the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Heather Richter in Student Life supported my office from February through September of 2022, and Bethany Prevea has been providing support from October 22 to the present. And for both of them, they took this work on in addition to their existing work, and I couldn't have been as successful as I have been without their help. And I really want to take this opportunity to thank them for that support. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Can we ask a question? Thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanted to ask uh, on that grant, what are what is the time period um, for the grant that you received? And are there plans already that you have um, to use it? I know it's a, a continued learning, but... Um, so are you talking about the um, Culturally Responsive Pedagogy and Practices yes. Grant? Innovative Best Practice Grant. Okay, so that's a two-year grant. It's um, $300,000. And um, the first year will be this coming year. So okay. 2023, 24, and then the second year, 24, 25. So Dr. Tejada and I are um, meeting to... Uh, develop the plan for this grant, but it basically, um, the proposal included building upon the work of the IEPI grant that was received um, a couple of years ago. So to really continue to work on developing culturally responsive pedagogy and thinking about how we can draw upon Global South pedagogical practices, right? And um, since so many of the students that we're educating are students from uh, communities that are historically Global South communities, being able to think about the pedagogies that are um, part of the cultural practices of those communities and how we can integrate them into um, instruction at Napa Valley College, but also thinking about um, extracurricular educational opportunities. And this is even more important as we're moving toward being a residential college, right? So our extracurricular activities um, are going to be increasing the importance of how can we take advantage of those opportunities to enrich the life of our students and do it in a way that um, honors their, their heritage, their cultural practices, that makes them feel very much included and respected and valuable members of our community. Thank you. Yes. Question. Um, thank you, Dr. Musami. This is um, a really impressive and comprehensive body of work. Congratulations to you and your team. Thank you so much. I have three questions. Um, the first one is the data from the student survey that you're going to present in, in the fall. Can, do we have, can we see that? Yes. Do you mind sending that to the board? I'd love to read through. Yes. I actually had wanted to share that with you earlier and the agenda was so full that yeah. it got bumped back. So um, yes, I will send the report to right. the committee to um, review. And I invite you all to come to the Fall Flex Day yeah. um, 
presentation. That's going to be on August 10th at nine o'clock in the morning. I think it's the Thursday, the second day of Fall Flex Day. So right. it'll be the morning convocation where Dr. Powell, Dr. Mora, Dr. Guerrero, and I will be talking about the survey data and also how we're going to address, you know, what is indicated in the data, where are where we're, you know, falling short of what we need to be doing for our students. Wonderful. Thank and, you. And Trustee Alton, just I know you had a few more questions, but just on that topic. So would we because I know you sir or maybe Dr. Powell, you circulated out the PowerPoint when when you did that. Would we be able to see the actual data? Because I think probably in the PowerPoint it wasn't, you know, all the questions. Yes, uh, absolutely. Right? I'll the share the reports stuff. with yeah, you. That'd be awesome. cool. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. And um we should have the report on, on the survey that was done with the non-instructional staff, we should be getting that, I would think, in the fall. So we'll have more data as well, and I'll be happy to share that with you as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, another question is, how can we let our greater community know about the good work that you and your team are doing? That doesn't need to be answered right now, but I think that's something we should all think about. I think, I think you're absolutely right, because when we had the the part series on Onitsati's ways of um, being and doing. Mm -hmm. And we shared the invitation with the Equity and Inclusivity Council. We really had a lot of people from the community that came to that presentation. They were really excited to know about this. They really came out. And so I think we really just need to do a better job of yeah. advertising um, these important programs because uh, there's a lot of work that goes into developing them and we can be really expanding the footprint of the impact that we're making at the college by sharing this with the community and having them participate as well. And were those recorded? I, I thought I asked if they were going to be on Zoom or recorded. The, somehow. the, the um, presentation. On Satis, yes. um, no, they did not want, they expressly asked that we oh, do not record okay. them. So mm -hmm. we don't have recordings okay. of those. Yeah. And then my final question is just, um, you know, as you know, our number one board goal for this coming year is to lead from a framework that advances diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, and accessibility. So how can we, as the Board of Trustees, support you in your work? Oh, that's such a wonderful question. Um, well, first of all, it really is important to me to know that the Board of Trustees wants to support me in this work. So I really appreciate that, you know, as an outset. Um, and uh, how you can support me in the work? Well, one, like you asked about how do we make this, um, what we're doing here known to the community. So if the board can help to um, disseminate the information about our programs, um, you know, uh, Denise Kadori is gonna be working on developing a calendar of events. And so I hope we're, as an institution, we're gonna be doing a better job of making visible the programming that we're doing at the college. Um, so that'll be available. Um, and I would just say that, you know, the board being committed to um, continuing to increase their literacy around DEI issues to engage in um, training, um, you're our leaders, right? And so the example that you show really uh, filters down to our community. And so being engaged in active and ongoing learning around these areas. And, um, you know, that's that's another great way to support our work. And I'll think of other ways okay. and um, <laughs> communicate with you. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Baker. Um, quick question and then a comment. First, I wanted to ask about the anti-racism racism in the workplace non-credit course. Is that going to be available virtually and asynchronous uh, for workplace people? Because I can think of quite a few people who would be interested but may not be able to do it in person or even a class that has specific times. Mm -hmm. So I will ask Chantel Ritchell to reach out to you with okay. that information. Um, this is really under her purview. So uh, I helped um, with the development of the template for the course. So the next step will be for um, her office to 
find the faculty that will teach the course and to arrange when it will be offered and, you know, for how much and in what modes it will be offered, et cetera. So I'll, I'll ask her to be in touch with Thank you. Thank you. And then my comment is kind of echoing uh, Trustee Olson. Um, just earlier today, uh, my my workplace is engaging in um, some work of this type. We're just getting started. And um, we, one of the things we've done is we contracted with the National League of Cities to help lead that. And so their first step was to interview all the department heads and kind of to get a baseline. And so I was got interviewed earlier today and just wanted to let you know, I referenced you and your work several times during that interview. Mm -hmm. So you've definitely done amazing work and I hope you continue with us for a long time. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate that. And I'm happy, I'm happy to be a resource, you know, not only to Napa Valley College, but to other organizations in the, re in the region. So definitely, that would be an honor. Thank you. I'd like to also extend my thanks. I think you've done great work. Um, I saw at least one event that I was sad that I missed. And so, yeah, we got to do a better, better job of disseminate, disseminating the information of what's going on. Um, but I am curious if you have any prospective dates on that Global South Music Festival, because I'm really looking forward to that. Um, let's see, it's, uh, I, I think it's in October. I believe it's October. Awesome. Um, this is the first event. So it's, um, it's um, can't think of the name of the event, but it's basically a one woman show who is enacting the work of three important Latina musicians. One is Celia Cruz, and I can't think of the other two women. So that's going to be an event at um, at the Performing Arts Center. So that's going to be in October of this year. But I'll tell you what our con conversation was focused upon is that we've got the mariachi festival that happens in the spring, and that's amazing, right? And it's such an important festival um, for our community. But in the fall, we're not really doing anything that has that same kind of impact um, with the community. Um, and so we're thinking, well, maybe in the fall, we can start to think about a global South event that would um, represent the culture of other communities at our college. So the, the Mariachi Festival is a really great um, expression of Mexican culture, right? But what about the other communities that, uh, that represent our student body? So if we can start to develop, you know, breadth in terms of uh, the cultural programming and performance programming that can, you know, diversify our, our offerings in performing arts, that's something that we're really wanting to work on. So it will be this this year, October, and then we're going to be planning for subsequent years. But Keller, thank you. I think the dates are actually October first uh, and October second. It's called Las Magnificas. Awesome. More information next right before my birthday. I'll be there. Good. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitsami. Thank you. Move on to uh, an action item. Item twelve point one: Program Pathway Mapper onboarding and licensing agreement. Dr. Moore, I don't know if you had a presentation or it's available for questions or? I'm happy to answer any questions. You could like a brief uh, set of information about it either way. The board, do I see anything? Okay. I'd welcome a motion for approval. So moved. Thank you, Trustee DeLuna and Trustee Olson for your second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Agreement adopted unanimously. We we'll move on to 13.1, the Kurt uh, Hertzer Inspection Services proposal. I would echo uh, Dr. Moore's response. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, this is a large dollar item, $605,000. I did want to just add a little detail here. These are inspection services required to meet DSA standards and uh, these are funds completely covered by the student housing project. 
because DSA has uh, a responsibility to the state and to this institution that the financial relationship needs to be maintained by the institution. So uh, while we pay the initial uh, fee, the bills as they come in, we pass them immediately on to the project funding and they're reimbursed. Uh, so uh, again, uh, this is uh, a no cost to the institution and as part of the student housing project funding. Jim, I just had, excuse me. I just had one question about how that worked. So this is required by DSA that we find the inspectors and pay for them. I know it's paid by the project, but DSA doesn't send out inspectors to inspect the, the project as say the local um, you know, uh, county would do for projects. The, uh, we retain these as independent inspectors uh, um, through by contract with a firm, and these inspectors have been certified by DSA to do this. Does that answer your question? Not, not really. You know how if I go build my house here in the county, the county sends the inspector to make sure that everything's done according to code. So does DSA send inspectors out to make sure we're meeting their standards? Or does this take the place of that? The latter, Trustee Rios. This, this, this takes place. Uh, um, this this uh, performs a role of inspection services for DA, DSA, and they report directly to DSA. Thank you. Thank you, um, Trustee Iverson. Was that a motion for approval? Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Trustee Rios. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? agreement or proposal adopted unanimously. And we will move on to item 13.2, uh, Lucian uh, Services presentation. Thank you, Trustee Dodd. Uh, just over a year ago, the college experienced a cyber attack uh, that brought the institution to its knees in many respects. Uh, we were unable to deliver services to, um, to our students, unable to pay our bills for a bit of time. Uh, it was an extraordinarily challenging time that many of you remember. It also revealed that that we we needed to make a commitment to investments, uh, to maintain our infrastructure, to maintain our, our systems, and also investments to enhance our ability to manage and, and serve the community in a way that we had not been able to do before. The, the baton for IT was passed to me about 10 minutes after that happened. And, uh, and the request was made by Dr. Powell and others to say, how do we do this better? How do we uh, uh, provide assurances that our systems are secure and reliable? and well managed and uh, in that time i have looked at a variety of uh, possible solutions and today uh, we're going to introduce you to um, a managed services approach from the lucian firm lucian provides our enterprise systems now uh, th th this is the backbone of our systems as we as we operate the institution. So there is a, a symbiotic relationship between what we have now and what we're proposing in terms of managed services. Four gentlemen fitted with earpieces and speaking quietly into their cuffs are, are from Eleusian. I would ask them to introduce themselves and uh, would they have a, a presentation for us. And yeah, you could uh, go ahead and hit the mic just because we have uh, folks here remotely. Good evening, everyone, and welcome, or thank you for welcoming us. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to meet with you here today uh, and describe how we hope to be able to partner with Napa Valley College uh, in order to significantly improve information technology, help you achieve a highly effective IT function, really for the purpose of improving every aspect of Napa Valley College, recruitment, retention, competitive position, et cetera. Security is just one aspect, uh, but enabling Napa Valley College to successfully serve students to ensure their success is really what we're all about. My name is Bob Kaminsky, and I am Vice President of the Aleutian Managed Services Division. Uh, I've been with the company for over 33 years now, and with the exception of a few years right out of college in public accounting, 
uh, as a staff auditor at Price Waterhouse, uh, my entire career has been dedicated exclusively to IT management within higher education. And I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves individually also. Good evening. My name is Lawrence Rue. I've been with Elucine for about 20 years, actually next week, which is a <laughs> pretty incredible, right? I have a background as a CIO for about 30 years in higher education and in community colleges. Um, I'm myself in the first generation college graduate with the community colleges, got a four year degree and a master's degree from that. And I've been in cybersecurity, institutional improvement, and really love this company because it cares about higher ed, cares about students, and it's been a great place to work. So thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Alstrom. I am a general manager with Ocean Managed Services. I've been working in higher education since 1999 working with the Lucian since 2005. Um, majority of my tenure is at a community college where I'm CIO for 11 years in West Michigan. And happy to be here, thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is David Buck. And uh, I apologize for the squad. <laughs> but uh, we had a chance to come to wine country. We didn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> My name is David Buck, as I mentioned. Uh, I've been with the company about 16 years. Uh, most of that time is either a CIO or a general manager, much like Mike. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I've joined uh, Bob's team, and my primary role is this, uh, as well as engineering uh, the relationships uh, for the elusive side going forward. So uh, I have a, I just have a book of notes. I did have a funny joke about the whole warrant, but I think I'd do the humor to you, right? Go ahead and the next slide. That was very funny, by the way. I really liked it. And I will steal it later, too. Uh, so tonight, we're just going to really brief that. And in respect for your time, we're going to try to get through this in you know, 15, 20 minutes and leave some time for questions. Uh, that does not mean that you can't at any time uh, ask us questions beyond this as well. So. Uh, and it's more important that you do get your questions answered this evening rather than I get through. I don't think there's 19 slides. I think maybe there's 15 operating slides. So tonight we're going to cover a little bit about who we are uh, as Lucian, um, a little bit what we're proposing for Napa Valley College. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about why uh, we feel we're the best solution, uh, particularly in terms of community colleges. Next slide. Go ahead. So this is what I like to refer to as our brag slow. Um, Lucian is without a doubt the largest um, technology provider in higher education. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the company provides the ERP system that Napa Valley College uses, uh, but they also provide a wide range of services related to higher education. Uh, and the division that uh, my squad here and I work with uh, is the managed services division. Uh, we're quite separate from the software, uh, but we do uh, participate with them. But as a company, we support uh, a little over 2,500 institutions. Uh, that represents over 20 million students that we work with. And for managed services, uh, one of our, my pride points is about 74% of our customers have been with us for more than 10 years. So once they start working with us, we produce results. Uh, they tend to, to enjoy those and stay with them. Uh, and we've worked with over 500 institutions in terms of managed services not software specifically, but in terms of managed services uh, over the last 50 to 55 years of our um, existence as managed services. Next slide. This is a little bit about how we conduct managed services. We consider it a, a partnership model. Uh, a lot of folks will provide uh, individual staff, or task support. Uh, we look at it a little differently. We learned a long time ago that simply providing um, a, a quality technology isn't sufficient really to get the job done. We really have to work with the school to be better, right? We found in the early part of our uh, um, existence that we would come in and make a great IT operation, but the school really wasn't acting any differently. So we kind of modified our approach and again, we go kind of a partnership model. We really look at the strategic alignment. We want to know what the school is trying to achieve overall. As an example, uh, I've heard you referenced a couple of times tonight, your, your student uh, housing project. Uh, those kinds of things. We really want to be involved at that level. Uh, we strongly recommend that the leadership that we provide be able to interact directly with the cabinet um, and uh, make ourselves available to that level. 
we're an accountable model. Um, we want to, uh, if, if we worked with Jim to build out a potential model here, that allows you to hold us accountable for a particular set of operations, not just the fact that maybe one of our people here helped you with your network, but we're responsible for the outcomes of in a certain one. We want you to be able to look at that, and we want to be able to tell you that, right? Put it out on a dashboard and let you measure for yourselves what we're doing. Uh, we believe in transparency. We're a comprehensive solution. Uh, again, we don't just do staff augmentation. We look at services as a way to help the school improve their capabilities. And then flexible services. This is where we find a lot of our schools enjoy that relationship with us, especially small to medium-sized schools that would otherwise be challenged to have the breadth of skills that are now necessary to run IT in an organization like Napa Valley Corporation. Next slide, please. So, and this is a little more specifically about how we actually deliver on those uh, commitments. <clears throat> so our model is to place a highly capable staff on the campus. We will locate those staff to Napa Valley. I know it's going to be difficult. So we have to bear and come down and, and, and join you in this fine area. <laughs> but we place a, a capable staff on campus and we surround those folks with very dedicated, but probably remote. Uh, well, most of them, they're coming back to, uh, to campus and back as needed. Um, but we surround those with experts and every imaginable um, expertise you might consider for higher education. And then beyond that, we have a huge pool of our consultants. They are our employees, not external consultants, but our consultants that have experience in every aspect of higher education operations and academics, as well as every aspect of IT that you can imagine. If you've imagined a product that you use, I can virtually guarantee you we have somebody who's also worked with an implemented. So we surround that that pool of amazing uh, talent we surround them with. And we do that, as we mentioned, uh, for currently about 160 uh, institutions across the country, just for managed services. Next slide. And we actually capitalize on that uh, over those 50 years of experience, 50 plus years of experience, and the 3,000 of the key professionals we have dedicated solely to higher education. We brought all that information, that learning we've had over those 50 years back, right? And you benefit from that. Uh, and what I mean by that very specifically is if we have a, a staff member working with Tampa Valley College and you guys have a question, you're trying to, for instance, I've worked personally with the numbers of community colleges that have moved into student housing projects. We can probably provide you some information about that that you might not have otherwise experienced, right? And that's our expectation of our staff. We want to bring not just um, good quality IT operations, we want to bring innovation to you as well. We want to make sure that you benefit from that huge network effect that we bring with us. Next slide, please. Some of our strengths we'd like to point out, <clears throat> uh, we are higher ed practitioners. We work in no other market space. Our software, our services, all of them are dedicated to higher education. And in fact, we've been named as the only um, as the only uh, organization that dedicates solely to higher education, we've been recognized in the top 100 companies that do that kind of work, do outsourcing type of work. Uh, and we're the only one in higher education that's been recognized uh, but for seven years right now. Uh, we have that deep and broad expertise, which I'll get into a little bit more here in a minute, that, that we to offer to the schools. We look for that strategic alignment. We are technically product independent. We work with schools that use every form of software and ERP system, whether they be Lucian products or not. And when we do bring particularly good expertise for the Lucian set of ERP tools, as an example, uh, if something's going wrong with the ERP, we can actually grab the developers, and we have done so. And so you get that little bit better connection with your with your ERP vendor through us. But again, we work with all schools using virtually every product. We have, we set the standards and best practices and proven methodologies. Again, looking for that strategic impact, innovation, significant risk reduction. And our four folks are trained in how to protect campuses, not just organizations, but specifically campuses in terms of security. Of course, that's going to get more interesting here as you move forward with your student housing. Right? You're now about to have these students on your network, some form of your network, 24 hours a day. So that's going to be even more important to understand. And then we have the, the uh, proven startup process that truly is the industry standard. 
that's what the slide is. This next group of slides, we're going to talk a little bit about what we propose for Napa Valley College. Our service ranges will be an IT leader, specifically a CIO, that we will relocate and bring to Napa Valley College. Again, it's a hardship that they'll have to bear up to. But you, uh, as a board and as a, a um, the administration will have an opportunity to, to interact with folks as we bring them to campus. It's important to be essential that that person be able to interact at the cabinet level, in fact, at the board level, and across the campus in an effective way. Right? So it's important that who we bring to campus is a good fit. And so we'll work with you to do that. But that person will become equipped with knowledge about higher education and IT. Again, this person isn't going to be, okay, what's your problem? I'm going to go fix that. They're going to be meeting with each of the vice presidents, finding out what their barriers are, and hopefully bringing them ideas that they may not have otherwise known right, through our network of connections. We're going to provide strategic services. Uh, one of the things we noted right away is that there needs to be a little bit better uh, framework for making decisions around IT, the purchases and implementations and time spent. We need to make sure that they align with what they're trying to achieve as an institution. So we have a proven uh, IT governance model that we can bring to campus. We modify it uh, for each institution, right? But we have a team that comes in and helps you develop that governance process so that you know that your priorities are getting the most attention from, from IT. We also bring a change management um, implementation. So communication happens well around this change that hopefully is going to be happening. Uh, we have a communications planning process that we bring to campus. These are all the folks that are dedicated to that process that come and assist uh, uh, Mountain Valley College and the CIO that we assigned to get those things done. We'll also be providing uh, application services. Uh, these folks uh, will be working um, directly for Napa Valley College. Those will be pe people that your staff, the key staff, get to know and rely on uh, to bring that that information about not just the Lucian products that you use, but about every application that's used on campus. And we'll also provide additional support in your infrastructure area. Same thing, we find that your CIO will know the kinds of activities you need to do to secure the campus, but this will provide a little extra help for your team, your IT team, to really action on that security element. Make sure that your logs are being you know, carefully monitored, that the right kinds of security aspects are being met on, on campus, as well as your application security as well, making sure that you know the right uh, processes. No, and I'm sure that it will generate some policy to come to the, to the board to, to, to move forward. And then we're going to provide that, as I mentioned earlier, that just in time deep bench access. For a lot of our organizations, whether they be small or large these days, it's just too expensive to keep that broad range of IT experts that you need all of the time. You guys are moving through projects and listen to you this evening and you have various projects going on on campus. You just can't afford to have specific project expertise on your campus all the time. You need them when you need them, and then you need to move on and take their expense with them. That's what we're able to provide. That huge pool of consultants that I mentioned earlier, those folks are available in Napa Valley College as you need them. All right, so if we decide we need to um, uh, some projects related to your housing, we need to make sure that the network is set up correctly and interacts with the base network so that you know, there's not a crossover, there's some security there. We have people who've done specifically that, that we will engage, right? They'll get that project done, they'll make sure it's working right, and then they move on. They're always available to you. They move on, they take, and then we move to the next project. We bring the experts in for that as well. That's what a lot of schools like most about working with us, that ability for us to provide. For the equivalent of a single position, we can provide hundreds of, of skill capabilities that you might not otherwise be able to find. Next slide. Again, I mentioned that nationally recognized startup process. Um, you might wonder why I hit this particularly, but because we have found that that startup process is essential to start off in a great relationship so that we're successful over time. So what we do is we bring in a startup team. Uh, it takes some time. It'll even take a little time to convince somebody to come here. But it takes a little bit of time to get those folks on campus. So we bring in a transition, right? That helps us do more quickly. But we also found that during that startup and transition period, there's a lot of change happening. And that is uncomfortable for a lot of folks. So we like to identify that change with our transition folks so that when we bring in more ongoing or full-time uh, folks, 
that change that that angst goes with the transition team and the new folks get to start fresh, right? With a new set of issues. We find that's uh, been very uh, important. We also integrate with the coach. Right? We train our folks. They don't come in looking like a bunch of FBI agents or with only seeing badges in them. Um, they want to integrate with the coach, right? Um, unless you want to, sometimes some schools want to know that there's some significant change on campus. Typically, we want to integrate with the campus. We want you to be surprised that there's somebody working here that isn't necessarily directly an Alabama Valley College uh, employee. Uh, we'll act like it, sound like it, represent just like it, um, but we want to blend in and, and really just provide that additional capability and talent but without standing in. When I uh, get off right away to a 30, 60, and 90 day plan, uh, we're already anxious to have that process in, in working with Jeff. We know what some of your pain points are. And so we're already piecing that into our you know, delivery folks so they can start generating a plan. So they're going to come to campus ready to go. Right? There's a lot of things. Now they're going to check all that off with the leadership with you, uh, but they're going to come ready to go uh, with a plan. And they're going to focus initially, gonna, they wanna, really want to know what those big uh, issues are, those lagging issues, things that have been annoying, things you haven't been able to accomplish. Well, they're going to want to know what those are. We're going to put those high on that priority list. We're also going to look for those low hanging fruit, right? Some things that we walk in and go, well, we can do that right away. And so we want to show uh, some early wins, right? But again, we've noticed that getting off to a fast and uh, secure start is important. Next slide. So, what can you expect in the first year? Again, the leadership, um, the folks, uh, you'll meet them, and they're going to spend a lot of time building relationships with the campus at all levels. Uh, the gentleman who runs that particular area likes to say he wants their CIOs to be relation make relationships high, wide, and deep. And the first thing he tells them to do is lay up their positions, right? They're not going to stay in their office and wait for the problems to come to them. They're going to be out on the campus watching courses being taught, watching meetings being held as much as they can, uh, and meeting with leaders and directors of the campus. They're going to be building those relationships uh, of trust and understanding. We found that when these folks talk with you, they, the, the, your staff will in a way realize their expertise, that they come not just as IT experts, but higher education experts as well. We're going to do triage. Right? We're going to go through your current problems, figure out what can we fix very quickly, what should you want to fix very quickly, and then build out that priorities list after that through that governance process. We're also going to generate now that 360 and 90 day plan, we're going to generate one year plan. And we do that every year after that. Uh, that one year plan should align with the strategic plan that we're going to help you develop as well for IT. We can also help you develop a strategic plan as an institution, but we're going to start by developing one for IT. Hopefully, you might have a, a plan for the institution and we'll align with that. We're going to develop, help you develop your strategy. How do we get these things done? We're going to start developing that change management process so that people understand why the change is happening and effectively understand what's going on in IT. We're going to develop a communication plan, which will include not just uh, specific uh, communication paths, means bad things happen, uh, power outages, network attacks, whatever the case may be. Um, but we're also going to have uh, communications around uh, every day to day operation in IT. We're very, we need a lot in transparency. We're going to have uh, dashboards up on the web that can be available to everybody on campus. I mean, everybody, students, administration, faculty, board, so that you can see what's happening in IT, what progress is being made, and when you might expect to get some attention to your progress, right? And that's what the real question is. Whenever we set up priorities, nobody really argues with that except why am I not a priority? We're really good at explaining to the folks why that's the case, and more importantly, when they might become that priority. And then we're also going to deliver a grants program. Um, that's the initial part of our grants uh, offering. We're going to look, we're going to come in and meet with you, meet with the campus, understand what your priorities are, what your projects are, what you're trying to achieve. And then we're going to go out and scan local, state, federal, private grants to find which of those are in line with what you're trying to achieve. We also learned a long time ago that just getting grants is not what you want. You want to get grants to represent what you're trying to achieve. So we'll be looking at that report the first year as well. Next slide, please. Again, we view it as a partnership model. Uh, we want to make sure that when we're done, that you have a technology environment, environment that really exceeds your students' expectations. Um, we're also going to make sure that the customer service, right, that responsiveness, not just in transparency, 
but we believe in communicate, over communicating, right? So when we get a request in, we want to make sure that if, if your staff or your student or your uh, um, administrator hits send on the email for help, they don't think about it again because they know the follow up is coming. They don't have to hear about it. You know what happened, they'll have to call them again. Or if they call for him, same thing happens. They don't worry about they make the call, they hang it up to go on with their job because they know without a doubt that somebody's going to be there shortly to help them with their issue. We want to make sure that we reduce that friction or mobile, we have all those things that you want for your students, whether they be in housing, whether they be the, uh, online, asynchronous, I love the fact that schools know what that is, versus synchronous. Um, we want to make sure that that stuff is, is very functional for you. We also believe in working with these students. Uh, we have programs that, that help students move in. We have um, scholarship and internship programs to work with your students, uh, quite large ones. Right? And we also offer scholarship program. It's very small, but it's directed towards student scholarship. Next slide. And then a little bit about why we know community colleges. So we thought this would be a, a useful slide for you guys, so that you understand we, we work with the privates, a lot of large publics, we work with a whole lot of community colleges. And we know that you guys have to be much more nimble and quick than the other categories of schools, right? You guys are so closely related to the community. You don't have the choice. Most of you are in the community, working in business that's supported by the school, and the product of the school. Uh, and you guys well know that you'll hear about it. If you're not producing the kinds of, of employees they need, they're going to tell you about it, right? So we know that you have to be connected to the community and responsive to them. And so again, that commitment to workforce development, right? Your businesses in this area need trained people, and they're looking to you to do that. And I'm sure more of you hear that on a regular basis. And we also understand the unique relationship uh, for trustees to community college. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, said financial stability long-term official physical health, even more so for private schools, for sure. Uh, the operation of effectiveness. You know, you guys are all listening and getting uh, information on what's going on. You just heard a presentation on it. So you guys are very close to what's happening you know, on the campus and with the students. You've got to provide that unwavering support to the president. Um, again, because that connection to the community, you know, it's nice if you're private school and you Students are coming in from all over. You don't have that connection. You do in your community college. And as a board, I'm sure I know you feel it. you have to support the president. And then, and we wrote this before we heard tonight's presentation, but then honor and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. You guys, because you live in particularly in Napa Valley, you're very close to that particular issue. And I heard it in questions tonight. That was we really appreciate that. So we know how it works with community colleges because we work with a lot of them, as you'll see in the next slide. Please. This is uh, just a smattering of, you don't have to worry about moving my pictures. Um, this is just a smattering of, of uh, icons we use. This is not even a small number of the community. These are just two schools we work with. This is not even a small number. We work with vast number than this right now. But these are a few that we thought um, might be interesting to you. They're somewhat similar in terms of their size or their makeup or their unique locations and the like. Next slide. Oops, so this is where it, we thought it might be interesting to you that um, approximately half of the managed services customers are community colleges. The other half is a matter of privacy in large, uh, in large research institutions. We are currently delivering managed services to 20 colleges in California, and about half of those are 85% of our California, of the California community colleges are using some form of the Elysium ERP system. And 80 plus percent of community colleges nationally are using one of our ERP um, products. So we do a lot of these community colleges. We really do understand the kinds of challenges that you face. Next slide. I believe that's it. Hopefully that was brief enough. Questions? That was that good. Yeah. That was. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Trustee Baker. I just had a quick question about the deep bench that you mentioned. Um, is that so? It's for special. It's for special or limited projects. Is that part of what the the 
overall contract that we have or do you, is there does that trigger additional fees when we have to dig into that bench it does not it's a, we believe uh, that partnership model part of our business model is we're kind of a single cost model we we work with the school to figure out what you need and we offer that to you now if something huge changes you know you double in size or something and you want to come to us but it, it'll always those any changes or any additional charges would always be initiated by you uh, because you've asked for something more different, and I don't mean more in terms of what we're already providing. But let's say you decide you would like us to run uh, some other aspect of, of IT that we're not currently doing. We can always add that on, but you'll never see us come back uh, in and of itself with additional fees for anything. Question. Well, I, if, if I could just add a comment, yeah, I, I think it's important to note that uh, this solution does not displace or replace any current employees in our IT staff. And in fact, we believe that this managed services approach um, helps model how they can advance their own careers in IT and and be prepared to take on these positions, higher level positions as they move through their career arc. So we view this not only as an opportunity for the institution to be advantaged by the experience that Elysium brings, but the co our colleagues in IT uh, to be advantaged as well. So uh, I have spoken with the IT staff on, on uh, uh, several occasions about the transition here. I think I could... Um, uh, I could describe it as a welcomed uh, kind of advancement in our ability to deliver services here. And I've also spoke with um, with the uh, classified union about this in a meet and confer, uh, and um, they were they were open and welcome to these kinds of um, uh, this kind of approach to advancing our IT services here. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. In terms of the, the business side of this engagement contract, what is what is the general timing that um, everyone's thinking? The uh, the Lucian firm is, has uh, presented me with a contract that um, I'm arm wrestling them uh, with them a little bit about it at this point, yeah. um, and uh, we have a few more things to work through. But I anticipate putting that contract before you at your next meeting. It's and how, how generally are the the fees based? Is it, you do it off of uh, amount of services offered, kind of base it off general enrollment. No, no, it's based on yeah. the services you need. Yeah, yeah, right. okay. And it, well, it, it obviously the size of the institution has some impact. Sure, um, but it's also based on what you're working on right now with the projects we've seen in your in your portfolio coming up over the next several years. So it's it's based on a number of those things, but not really directly tied to FTE. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Everton, yeah. Quick question. So how does it, how does all this tie in with like a lack of an infrastructure if we don't have the infrastructure? Like, is that something that you guys will direct and guide us on to or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, um, I, I think one of the important things you need to, you need is um, to make really informed acquisitions. Right? You want to make sure that what you, what you're acquiring really aligns with what you're trying to achieve for as long as possible. And we have that expertise, right? We don't want, you know, a lot of schools, we work on the school right now that has 12 firewalls. We're not sure why. Well, we they told us why, but it doesn't make sense. So those kinds of things, you don't want, you don't need that and you shouldn't be doing that. So we believe that through our expertise, we could probably save you some money in that regard. But either way, we want to make sure that you make those really informed decisions around purchasing of equipment. And Trustee Iverson, I, I want to be careful that we don't um, represent that Elucian will pay for those infrastructure investments, unless you gentlemen are willing to do that. Uh, but that would be... Uh, Government salaries and all. <laughs> that would certainly be on us, but they would provide us a plan, a total cost of ownership uh, down the road that would, would help us prevent the kinds of challenges we've had in the past. Just think of our lovely server room at the... The sprinkler system that it has in it. Our goal will be to shrink your server room as quickly as, as affordably as possible. Most of that stuff should be in the cloud. Trustee Rios. So my, my question is kind of related to um, to uh, Trustee Iverson's question. And have you done an, a kind of a ass preliminary assessment of our situation and our infrastructure and those things? And has that been taken into account in whatever your proposal? Yes. 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 We received a considerable amount of information from Jim, from the IT team, and we've done we've done our due diligence in that regard. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Buck. And team, You're welcome. And team, thank you all for being here. Thanks for having fun with, working with you. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> We're back to our superiors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good, good. Thank you, Jim, for for coordinating that and bringing those folks here. That's good to hear. Um, uh, Mr. Reeves, uh, the General Fund Eleven budget update. This is going to be a brief update. Um, unless you have extensive questions, uh, Trustee Iverson typically does, so I can't guarantee it'll be brief. This report is um, for month 12 out of 12, so it is, uh, it, it, is, it is a work in progress. Let me just couch this carefully. Um, this is a um, end of the year report in June. It may look very similar to the one I present to you in in uh, excuse me in 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 august as we're going through the exercise of closing our financial books making those final adjustments and transfers and finally uh, uh the the uh, the final test is the audit which we are embarking on at this very moment if you look at the final column on the right uh, as we've discussed in previous uh um, meetings are we all the way over there? We, we are, good. Um, you can see where we are landing uh, right now at 12 out of 12 months again. So there's, there are some um, pending entries here, um, but I'll, I'll draw a conclusion for you as we may make it through here. You can see our revenues total of about 99% of our budgeted revenues. So we are right on track there. There may be some, some slight um, additions there as we close our books, but we are we are doing very well there. Our uh, our total salaries are at 96% of budget, uh, so we're trending well there. We have a few outliers, a classified temporary. Um, some of that is uh, because of, that's where we post our vacation accruals, and there was some vacation um, taken uh, by some of our SERP participants as they concluded their time here. Um, the uh, faculty salaries temporary is at about 107 percent, um, which is it's not terrible. Uh, as you can see, our full-time salaries are only 96 percent, and so we're so we uh, uh, we had reduced expenses for permanent and slightly increased for um, temporary. So uh, all said, it's a fairly positive um, picture as we speak. Um, the the one thirty five percent is student employment, and um, and that the variance is about fifty four thousand dollars. I think that's worth a, uh, a look as we look to next year in our budget and how we're uh, how we're managing those funds. Our, our total employee benefits are ninety one percent, somewhat below our uh, our our budget, um, and and certainly positive news in terms of this budget. Total books and supplies are at 104%. Uh, the variance is fairly minor there. Um, so I am not too concerned there. And there may be some slight uh, transfers there as we close the books. Our total other operating supplies, uh, line 42, can't see all of it, but we're at about 100.01%. So about $300 in the budget. I, I take that as a win, by the way. Um, some of our capital capital outlay um, in, uh, postings need to occur, so we'll see some change there. And our OPEB, line 46, we'll need to see some postings there. We're only at 17%. There'll just need to be some transfers at the end of the year for some of the expenses related to retirement medical benefits. So that isn't fully realized. Um, the... The line 49, 48, 49 will show you will show you that we are looking at a $2.9 million increase in the fund balance. I would just be careful about repeating that too loudly. There's some adjustments that need to be made. 
but we're trending in a direction that will increase the fund balance here, which is a very positive side in terms of uh, the objectives of the board um, uh, over the last few years in terms of strengthening the college's financial position in, in this area. So that would conclude my report on Fund 11. Thank you. Trustee Baker. Two quick questions. Um, the revenue for, for under federal is only at 47%. I know it's only a small amount of money, but I'm just curious, are we still anticipating that we will get that money or is it, are we just, that's, we just over budgeted there? Which, which line is that, Trustee like Baker? The revenue under federal, very mm -hmm. top. Oh, no. Yes, it's, it's a small amount uh, to your point. Um, there may be some additional uh, some additional funding coming in. The variance is about twenty five six thousand dollars, so uh, it's off by about that same amount. Um, so there may be some additional revenue that hasn't been realized there. That may, uh, to some extent, be uh, part of uh, revenue that we'd realize as part of enrollments uh, link, um, uh, linked to enrollments. Um, but I would have some more, a better informed answer for that as we close the books and see how that actually played out and give you an explanation about why it is above or below variance. And do you anticipate closing in August or September? I think I would much rather uh, prepare that report as we have an audit in place. So that would be in, in the early fall. And then I just was curious about the uh, the amount that um, is potentially going into a uh, fund balance. So what if 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 we were actually able to realize an amount that's even close to that, where does that get us in terms of our percentage for fund balance? That's a pretty significant increase. If it stays exactly the way it is, which I, I would not guarantee, uh, it would increase our fund balance. Uh, and it would, uh, we would uh, likely make some decisions about perhaps where to park some of that. I would just remind us that we have a, uh, a subordinate liability for the housing at $650,000, that we might want to park that amount in our Fund 41, our capital, just to have that in place. And if we did that with this number, we would still see an increase in fund balance. Though, um, Trustee Baker, um, you will make me remember uh, that number if I if I give it to you now. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm reluctant to do home. that. I can go home and do the math myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll look forward to your report, Trustee okay. Baker. <laughs> That's all. The budget uh, is about $130,000. Our realize is about $130,000 less than our budget. Our, our total uh, revenue may not be completely realized yet. There is There are a few pieces that kind of trickle in. So we may see a slight bump there. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Reeves. We will uh, go on to uh, update a summary of the 23-24 state budget. Thank you, Trustee Dodd. Uh, the state budget was adopted by the governor in, in uh, mid-July. Um, I'm, this is, will be a very brief report. Uh, most of you, all of you know now that we are support, uh, supported primarily from local property taxes. And so the revenue we received actually from the state is a fairly small number. So with our property taxes and lo local revenue, uh, those, uh, those revenues amount to around 93% of our budget and about 6% comes from the state for fund 11. For Fund 12, which is an area I'm going to focus on now, Fund 12 are, are um, funds given to the institution for specific purposes, specific groups, or are time sensitive. And we call those categorical funds. So I'm gonna focus on the categorical funds since those have the largest impact on the institution. And in our categorical funds, um, do you wanna crack that open for me, Catherine? Thank you. And move to page eight. Selected categorical funds received uh, a COLA increase per the state of about 8.2%. Those are the only, excuse me, um, the only increases we'll see in category from state funds this year. 
So, uh, Trustee Olson, I'll provide you a hard copy of this. Um, you can see um, the programs that will receive that. They are not all of the categoricals, but they include uh, our DSPS program at an 8.2 percent. Cal Works next up, Basic Needs Center, Mesa. Uh, our enrollment for uh, adjusted for mandates, our block grant, our mental health services, uh, uh, rapid rehousing, Puente. Um, veterans resources, Emoja, uh, child care, et cetera. You can see those. Those are uh, pretty much encompasses them. So we can expect uh, an increase in, in, uh, in those funds of about 8.2%. These are not all the categorical funds. Uh, some funds will stay exactly as funded last year. I haven't seen anything that looks like a significant reduction in categorical funds. So, um, that's, uh, we'll take that as good news, frankly. The other areas we're seeing some changes is in the original. Uh, you can move to page, page 11, um, Catherine. We're, we saw a fairly drastic reduction in that scheduled maintenance um, uh, dollars, a little further down, thank you. Um, uh, fairly radical. You remember we had about 1.6 million, excuse me, 1.1 million dollars coming to Napa as a result of the initial budget. That's been cut just about by between 50 and 60 percent. And the state has said we can utilize some other resources in a more flexible way, including our outreach funds uh, and our student retention enrollment funds. Uh, in a way that, with a little more flexibility. So what they've said, they've reduced um, uh, uh, some funds and then said, folks, go, go put it all together and you decide how better best to use those particular funds. So that will uh, th that's a reduction in funds. The scheduled maintenance is also related to instructional equipment. And while um, we'll report those specific numbers as we get them from the state, um, those are two particular areas that, that will... Uh, not feel good to Napa Valley College. Um, so we'll report on uh, how those funds are used through Dr. Moore's area, instructional equipment, and through the facilities uh, area in terms of um, scheduled maintenance. We have posted the um, combined analysis to the website, and, and I welcome, uh, I would invite you to read through that uh, should you have a moment and the endurance it's fairly extensive, but uh, if you have further questions about that, I'd be happy to answer those. Trustee Anderson, can you put on your microphone? Uh, wasn't the state budget, we had a surplus this year. No, it wasn't as strong as we initially thought or? Uh, I, there is, uh, they're reporting future tax revenues to be lower than than they anticipated they've also left out a little a little opportunity to, to again adjust this in the fall based on expected uh, tax revenues so uh, while they have they have had a nice savings account the state has um, they, they have spent a lot of it as well uh, education they're describing as not being hurt dramatically but um, there there is not a lot of additional funding for for construction um, uh, and for capital investments across the state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reeves. Uh, we can uh, move to our uh, agenda uh, constituency reports. Um, I think we only have, is it associated students here today, Catherine? Oh, from, from uh, a classified. Great. Love to see new faces in our meetings. But, yeah. Okay. 
Hey, good afternoon. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. Powell, colleagues, and Napa Valley College community. I am so blessed to be joining you all this evening. I'd like to introduce myself. I am Jesenia Coda, the new union president of Classified Professionals. I am a Napa Valley College alum, and I've been working at Napa Valley College for eight years. I'm very eager to be an active union president. I would also like to announce our new classified executive board members. Gina Coda, Vice President, Amanda Frost, Chief Steward, Renee Coffin, Secretary, and Tui Gray, Treasurer. New to our negotiations team is Jason Bell. Uh, we also uh, welcome the following classified members to their positions and to Napa Valley College, however that's applicable, Patricia Gonzalez, Alina Padilla, and Justo Alvarez. We look forward to working with the district and the Board of Trustees members for our classified professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Jasenia, and thank you for uh, taking on the leadership role. It's a <laughs> thankless task, but um, we really appreciate you doing it and also being here uh, tonight. Um, any questions, thoughts, or? Right. We'll look forward to having you in meetings in the future, and, and thanks again for being here. Thank you so much. Okay. And Kathy, we don't have any other reports. I, I saw Ms. Tapia's uh, report is posted. Um, that's a pretty short report. Um, outside of that, if there are no other uh, folks here present, I will move on to president and board reports. Dr. Powell. Dr. Moore. Good evening, everyone. Um, so if we can open that report, I wanted to start with an update about summer session. So um, we have both six and eight week classes in the summer term. So the six week classes are concluding this week and the eight week classes two weeks from now. Um, so you can see the enrollments as of yesterday, um, comparing this summer to last summer, 2022. So you can see our enrollments and headcount are slightly up. You'll notice that I'm not including here FTES because we do have a number of positive attendance classes and those will affect what the final FTES is. So I anticipate being able to share that at our August meeting, but that is positive news. Um, and I also wanted to follow up on the presentation I gave last month on GO students. Um, <laughs> so uh, during the summer, what happened is we um, were seeing reports of GO students right before the summer session started. And this appears to be a time that um, they particularly target. But as a result of um, identifying them and thinking about strategies to address this, um, working with admissions and records and financial aid and faculty, um, we have developed a sort of rolling plan to address those students so that um, the students who have the characteristics that are commonly associated with GO students, we're notifying them um, that they need to come to the college either in person or via Zoom. So some way that we can authenticate to confirm some components of their enrollment. And if they don't do that within the identified time period, then we drop them from their courses. We want to be cautious not to drop real students, of course. So that's in, And it's a process in talking with colleagues um, in various parts of our system. The characteristics that are part of that detection, they, they need to be um, reviewed and updated over time because the ghost students are very sophisticated, smart ghosts. So um, that is what we are doing leading up to the fall semester. So I wanted to um, you know, just reconfirm that the, although fraud detection is a very important part of this, the primary goal is that we're not excluding uh, space for the real students from getting the classes that they need. That's our primary goal, because what we saw in the summer is we had many full sections and real students trying to get in. So we don't want that to happen. Um, you'll see when you look at the fall enrollment trends, it looks um, preposterously high. Uh, we do not believe this is because of ghosts. 
Um, it is if, you know, as uh, VP Reeves referenced, the cyber attack was uh, a little over a year ago. And post cyber attack, both uh, application and registration processes were very manual and it slowed everything down. So it's not really an accurate uh, comparison year to date as of July 19th to look at the numbers for enrollment and headcounts relative to today. So that probably accounts for a sizable um, amount of the difference. Another smaller factor is um, that we do have increasing partnerships thanks to the leadership of Christine Tapia and Doug Marriott and others. Um, in our dual enrollment populations. And so we are increasing the sections and the number of students at, of our local high schools. And that, that is leading to actual positive um, enrollment and headcount. So um, another component you'll see in this small graphic is the non-credit students, which are very, very small right now. And you might wonder, my goodness, that's uh, 54 enrollments. Um, Non-credit uh, programs tend to be enrolled very close to the start of term. Most people are not planning significantly ahead as they would for um, credit programs where they wanna make sure I get my required courses necessary for transfer. So we will see those numbers rise quite a bit. And then um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about um, Program Mapper. And thank you very much for approving item 12.1 on today's agenda. Um, the official name is Program Pathways Mapper, but it is commonly referred to as Program Mapper. This is part of our Guided Pathways Initiative. And um, if you haven't seen an example of Program Mapper before, what it does is it allows us to put on our website basically the program map that a student should follow for a particular program. And it's different from, of course, we have that information available in our catalog in a lot of different forums, um, but it, there's a big difference from seeing something in a visual way and with a very directed plan of study than trying to wade through the options in a catalog. So it's really significant change in the way that information can be presented to students. Um, the contract that you um, approved shows no cost to us because the California Community College Chancellor's Office is paying for the cost of that both the implementation as well as the licensing fee for at least the next several years. Um, so that is a project that we plan to complete in the coming year. And um, when we do have something up on the website, then I can give a very brief uh, presentation so you can see what it actually looks like. Right now, what I could show you is what um, some other colleges in our system have done in adopting this program, um, but I'd rather show you when Napa Valley College has that up and running. So thank you very much for approving that. Dr. Martin, I'm sorry, just reminded me of a question I did have on that agreement. And I saw that it was, um, it's a one-year agreement that annually renews. Mm -hmm. um, but if it doesn't renew for whatever reason, um, what is it? Community College Foundation, CCC, the, the, has effectively all like the intellectual property rights and they won't transfer that, I guess, upon any sort of the contract terminating. I don't know anything about the sophomore, you know, so to speak, but I just, that occurred to me, was well, that something, you know, if, if, unless it's very staff resource heavy with respect to, the, you know, the services on the other side, on the provider side, is that something actually that we would be able to operate here if they're, you know, their state does run out of funding to, to fund that program and providing that software. Is that something like something you know, like a Lucian could take on or, or something, something to that effect, or is that something that we could do internally? Um, I just caught that one term in there just about the, the IP um, piece. Yeah. So um, program mapper originally before um, the system decided to support it was being licensed on individual colleges were paying their costs. And the most significant cost is the initial startup because it's setting up the system, making sure the graphics align with your college's colors, images, all of that. Um, and then the annual licensing fee is a much smaller cost to continue using the software. So should there come a point in which the system's no longer supporting it, it would be the annual licensing fee. Um, but that's a much smaller cost. I don't know what it would be, but it's, I don't want to say negligible. There's no negligible in fiscal services, but, um, but it's something, it, it is a company and it's not something they would give to us we need to pay for annually gotcha. okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, <clears throat> good evening, board and community members, those of you out there in Zoomlandia. I uh, hope you are enjoying your nice, uh, warm um, July day. Um, so uh, my presentation today, I'm going to just update you around um, the busyness of, of uh, student affairs and what we've been doing over these last several weeks. Uh, I want to start off by first off by acknowledging the hard work of the, the Welcome Center as led by Brenda Rodriguez, Jessica Erickson, specifically around Napa Valley College enrollment uh, registration days, which happened on June 27th to the 29th um, on our campus. So this is, we modeled this or, or really developed this um, based off of the work that we did last summer when everything went down and we had to go back to literally filling out um, forms for, for students and, and, and helping them to do the registration process. But we found in that process is that connection to the community and that, that, that support of students and us being present to help them was really powerful and, and important and, and made some impacts for um, our community. So we did that again, this time really with this idea of kind of a one-stop shop in the admissions and records building, the 1300 building, where we had staff from, you'll see there are 14 different student affairs areas. So literally as students were walking into on the campus, they were learning about the Basic Needs Center, our STEM resources, student life, walked right in and were greeted by folks from admissions and records to really guide them as to what, what they needed to get done, what students needed to get done from filling out their applications to um, enrolling in classes, to walking right down the hall to financial aid, well, to counseling and financial aid. So we put financial aid and counseling in one room um, and EOPS was there, special programs were there, and it was really, really powerful activity. So, you know, we can do it. We can do this one-stop shop model. We did it for three days, um, and you can see the, the, the impacts that we made during that time. So that also helped to support the enrollments that um, some of these trends, although they were, they were not a major blimp, but it was, it was important nonetheless, 454 students um, or um, enrollments occurred throughout that time. You can see the amount of students that we served 49 counseling appointments um, in person and virtual occurred during that time as well. So the uh, the NVC registration days were a huge hit. We, we plan to continue to do these kinds of activities. Um, bilingual um, support as well was occurring throughout that time. We go to the next slide. Um, an activity that we just participated last Sunday was Dia de la Familia in downtown Napa. It's a beautiful, powerful activity. If you've ever attended it, I, I, I mean, you'll know how, how great it is. But this is an activity that Student Affairs has participated for many years, but, but it's put on by the Farm Workers uh, Foundation for Napa Valley. And this gave us the opportunity to have uh, a table. So actually, if you go to the next slide, um, and literally serve... There's 1,500 community members that attended this activity from little kids to, to, to elders, to um, folks just interested in, in learning about all different types of services. Napa Valley College had a table as well as many other services in, in the community. So this activity is done right outside St. John's uh, Catholic Church over, I believe it's on Vallejo Street. And um, the whole idea really is to, is as, as folks were coming out of, church or out of, out of mass, they are able to learn about the services um, available to them um, in the community. So uh, it was a hot day. It was like 94 degrees, but when you're under a tent um, with all your uh, Napa Valley College gear, um, it, it gets pretty hot. So nonetheless, uh, we were able to, to pass out our, our Napa Valley College fans. Those were super popular. And I think probably the biggest hit of, of that activity. So very pleased with that activity and that event. Uh, we've seen some students triple in as a as a uh, impact of that. So um, my my little girl was there too. She had fun the first five minutes, but then got pretty tired and uh, had to deal with the heat. But we we're, were we were good. Uh, next slide, please. So on uh, July thirteenth, I. Um, did keynote address for 10,000 Degrees with Shadler College Summit here on campus. So if you're not familiar with 10,000 Degrees, they are a nonprofit here in town that really focuses on developing, um, finding scholarships for students and, and helping students really navigate through higher education, first generation, low income students. Um, and we hosted them here at NBC. So they brought their staff, uh, an amazing staff, um, and about 50 students who are from our local schools um, here on a, on a, um, it was a Thursday morning at nine o'clock in the 
nine, nine o'clock a.m. On a, during their summer and, and listening to me speak to them. So it's pretty powerful, and I hope I engage them and motivate them. And then they got to experience out of like college. So we, we let them use our space for their, their summit. They learned about uh, college careers, majors, college exploration, uh, financial aid, and there's actually a panel there as well. So we, we hope to continue to build with them, partner with them around you know, what are some ways we can collectively serve um, our community. So more to come on on that relationship, but it was a great activity. And next slide. So this is the final slide, just to save the day um, for, for the board and for the community. Uh, we have Napa Valley called Spirit Week happening uh, September 5th through the 8th, which during that week, we're gonna be doing Club Rush. Um, also our annual transfer day will, will occur then. And also, please plan for our high school breakfast. We already have a date for that, November 9th. That's an uh, invite to all of our community um, partners, our schools, um, to come to Napa Valley College, learn about NBC, and uh, more, more information to follow on, on these activities. But I do plan on presenting to you soon, looking at doing it in August, a, a plan around outreach and all the other activities that we're doing at Valley, American Canyon. I value all the way through American Canyon and how important and critical it is for you to see those activities and prepare for them. So more to come on that too. So um, that concludes my report. A brief report. Uh, I have a written report. I, I would just refer you to uh, right after you read the joint analysis of the budget. Um, two items. First of all, just a really big thanks for, um, you know, kind of a uh, uh, your support and a topping off event for housing last week. Everyone was there. Nearly everyone in this room was there. And uh, it was really a momentous event for the college and keeps that project in the front of our publics, our students, our community, and those who uh, are interested in the success of this institution. There's an opportunity for a tour there through a portion of the building. Uh, I think it's exciting to see the prospect of what that uh, can do for students. And, and it's interesting to, to, to feel the scale of that project as well. It's really uh, quite an impressive project. So thank you for, for taking time out to be a part of that. Secondly, I just wanted to give you an update on the, the Ash Landfill and where we are with that. Uh, I met with the city, county, and our consultant in the field yesterday for a few hours. Um, and I think it's, it's moving in a very positive direction. Again, this is a portion that we will uh, put a, uh, an intermediate plan in place to, to be sure that every step uh, that we can take to make sure that that Ash Landfill is, is safe, um, uh, we're taking. It will likely require some additional work uh, for a permanent closure plan after we occupy housing, but our, our target today, our goal today is to be sure that we're safe with a, a, an intermediate plan to mitigate that site and make sure we're safe for opening of, for the opening of the residence halls. We do anticipate that the steps we take in the intermediate plan will translate to, to the permanent plan, um, but there's still some work to be done relative to whether the what the county will accept in terms of a, a permanent closure plan there. So just an update there and a little more details in my written plan, and I welcome you to take a look at that. Thank you. Um, that concludes our report. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Everything okay, Catherine? Well, we, we don't have any more presentations. I just don't understand it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well said. Keep them coming, everybody. Um, standing committee reports. Uh, anything from DOS, CNO, uh, Viticulture and Winery Foundation, Trustee Rios? No. Nothing from Audit and Finance. Nothing from Real Property. I'd say, yeah, uh, for Foundation, um, we have a meeting first week in August. I think uh, they moved it. It wasn't this one that they just moved it to the first week of August. Um, I did have an announcement to make related to the foundation is that through the foundation, we're putting on a little golf tournament. And you guys know, I, I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a golfer. So um, it, it, this is a bit of a golfer. Huh? You know, I won't, I won't, I won't go too far on that, uh, that, that leg, <laughs> Trustee Rios. 
Um, and, you know, uh, we've received a great amount of uh, support already, which is really great. And, and we're really focusing on our um, student athletes uh, programs um, too for, for that specific fundraiser. So happy to, to talk about that more, but you should have received an invitation to that. Even if you're not a golfer, we're doing, you know, pizza and wine um, uh, after, after the golf tournament too. So you don't need to be a golfer to participate, but I do know that trustee Iverson and trustee Rios have, uh, have uh, tentatively committed. And that's why I'm noting that publicly because now it is no longer tentative. Yeah. Um, so I, I will leave it at that and then provide a more substantive update after our meeting um, in, uh, in August. Um, future agenda item requests. I have a request. In May, we, this board, approved some fleet license plate readers and I would like to uh, revisit that discussion, please. Under, I guess, the purposes of revisiting it and how, and maybe maybe we could just table this and understand, I think, just a little bit more to talk with Dr. Powell before. I, I did talk with Dr. Powell earlier. Uh, I believe this was, it was going to come up as additional information, as an, a, another information item or update as to our, like the status of the project and in more context for specific questions you might have had. Is that correct? Or well, I I, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of information to share regarding success of fleet in the fleet Valeo's purchase of their of their product and some other articles of people who have uh, not appreciated them. Um, so yeah. I just would so like I guess to, 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 to the purpose, I guess the purpose of the agenda is for you to present information to the board um, related to the flock contract. Correct, sir. Okay. So in terms of, I don't know if, if there's any other folks that are second or interested in that discussion. I'm not seeing. Drop the system, right? It's already been approved. Yeah. Yeah, the purpose would be the defense of the rights of our students and to make sure that everybody is treated uh, appropriately to the full extent of the law and the U.S. Constitution and state constitution. Okay. okay. Um, is there any other? I, I'm not seeing any um, other nods in the affirmative about considering this. And I think our our board policies require I think at least three. Other trustees to um, no the agenda. So, are there any other agenda item requests? Okay. Then we will move on to trustee and board chair reports. I will start from my left and move over. Um, okay. Um, so I attended the July 4th parade um, with Trustee Baker and Dr. Mora, uh, Elizabeth Emmett, and the um, our um, performing arts uh, group who were on the back of a truck um, performing the entire three blocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really fun. We had a lot of fun, had a lot of fans and candy. Um, we're just wanting to have a conversation at some point about how we could get closer to the front of the parade and not be one of the very last. <laughs> Although there was a lot of people who hung out for the very end of the parade, but um, we weren't in the paper, you know, because all photographers were kind of focused on the front of the line. So yeah, I think we the problem to... was there was a gap. There was a significant there was a gap. gap. It was like a 10 But we were still at the very end. Yeah. Right. So if we could be kind of in the middle or above the fold, maybe, as you will, it'd be great. Um, I don't know. Just a consideration. Um, and then I also attended um, the topping, um, topping off ceremony, and it was amazing. As a new trustee, I didn't get to go to the groundbreaking event, so it was my first time being um, on the property and just seeing it up close, and, and um, it's just so exciting that we're ahead of schedule. Uh, it was really amazing to celebrate all the construction workers that were there that we provided lunch for. That was the, the, um, the best part for me was really celebrating their, their hard work. Um, so kudos to Napa Valley College and the whole team that made, is making this project possible. I'll move on to uh, Trustee uh, Iverson and then the student trustee. I uh, it was in the 4th of July parade with my Sunrise Rotary Club. 
and there was a big gap in it. I was actually done and walking back to the car when the <laughs> college came through. So we'll have to we'll have to figure that out. And I will bring it up when we go our, go through it with the club. Uh, also, recently had number three baby last week, so been busy with that. Oh, Remington Banks, Iverson. That's solid. RBI. I have nothing to report, but thank you. Nothing to report? No. <clears throat> Sorry, I was coughing. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> and I gave you a warning. Uh, Trusty Kishinev. I also attended the uh, topping off ceremony, which was a thrill and a neat experience because I've never toured a construction zone before. So that was cool. And I have nothing to report besides that. Trusty Rios. I was also at the topping off ceremony and it was exciting to see building up close and, and actually go inside. Uh, it's already, I think, you know, making, uh, giving the campus a whole different feel. Oh. So, uh, and today is I, I was actually, I usually come down Imola, I was coming up um, Saw School or coming down Saw School and that was a whole different view, especially now that the building is so much higher. It, it's just the whole thing, I think is really gonna change the feel of campus and it's actually gonna make campus more visible, I think, to people. So I think it's all, all great and it's gonna be wonderful for the students. Baker, Trustee Baker. Um, not a lot to report. At our last meeting, as it concluded, I walked across the way and did grad night. Uh, we had a little over 500 uh, graduates that participated in that event, and of course, a slew of volunteers. It was a, a fantastic night, a long night, and uh, we're already planning next year. So <laughs> it never ends. Uh, I also went to the July 4th and uh, actually like that day, like later in the day after I took a nap, um, I, I went home and designed fans for um, my work so that we, I, and they just arrived today, a thousand of them. And they say, I'm a library fan. <laughs> <on them. laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I would like to, I, I uh, also would like to see us a little closer to the front if we can make that happen. And I'd also like to see us do a bigger float. I think we could do bigger and better. It was great that for what was put together kind of last minute, but um and I know it's hard in the summertime because there aren't that many people here, but maybe we just start in April so we can get something really awesome to, uh, ready for July 4th next year. Um, the topping off ceremony was also very fun uh, and just a, a really neat to, I mean, I, I drive by it every day, twice a day, but to, to be there at ground level looking up, it is just enormous and, and so cool to see that coming together and be a part of that. Um, and I did do the math. If we were to put 2 million of that into reserve, we could get to 14%. So just putting that out there. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Baker. Trustee DeLuna. And just to add to the topping off ceremony, it's always nice to see everybody and be in such a celebratory like event. Um, it was really nice to sign the whatever the tile. And then a lot, a lot of the construction workers were saying, telling each other, you're like yeah, we have to sign before we, before we can go back to work or before we can eat or you know whatever it was at what, whatever point they were doing it, and I just you know thank them and told them you know thanks to their hard work where where we are now. So that was really fun. It was really nice to to see them all enjoying themselves at least, and I hope they do enjoy themselves being out here um, as they get the the housing done. So thank you. That's all. Yeah, and no injuries too. No injuries. Thank you. And I was not when he was saying that now I was saying I was knocking on wood. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um I just want to recognize uh that Dr. G so cool about 10,000 degrees um and having them on here. I don't think a lot of folks know what a really great organization that is in terms of providing peer support to students through high school and then also counseling and, and support all the way to college as well. For some reason, a couple of years ago, I've been involved with 10,000 degrees a bit. This campus totally shut them out. And I have no idea why that, what that is. And to have like you just call step in and do a whole totally 180 degree reversal. I just, it's an incredible organization offering really tremendous resources. So thank you for that. Um, 
and uh, totally echo all, all the comments on the on the topping off. It was a really really great in- event, and I was at the time when I was got the event or the in- invitation to. I was like, oh, we just did like we broke ground. Like what the heck? But uh, Jim, you're totally right. Keeping this in front of everybody. So it's it's first of all I got so many comments like so oh like that is I I was uh that's what that's what that that building is like I didn't realize that was the college and uh, um so yeah I mean it's that purpose alone it was really really successful um so announcement of a future meetings August tenth um emceed by Trustee Deluna because I will be on vacation next uh, next month um, with the family and uh, checking out what is it called discovery action yeah, discovery yeah. where, where uh, dr powell was sorry uh last week on, on, on vacation with his kids it's like discovery yeah. action land or something like that and then i'm going down yeah it's going down to orange counties which is where he was excuse, excuse the inside joke um and uh if nothing else to add we will adjourn at approximately 7 28 p.m